Okay, so here we are, STAT E100, week 14. And what we're doing is we're doing inferences for linear regression and for correlation. In a way, I would think this last week is, uh, as we've talked about before, it's considered a combination of reviews of other weeks that we've had before, namely covariance, the week on correlation, the week on simple regression. So um, those are just some fancy figures about distributions and um, about test statistics and critical values. But here's the big picture from earlier in the semester. If we think about the weeks that we had, we had a week on linear regression, we had correlation, and then we had covariance. Now, just as a review, what is covariance? Well, covariance uh, calculates the summary measure of an association between two variables. Uh, basically, it's the cross products of that X and Y. And the main in, key, the key point about covariance here is that it only gives us an indication about the sign of a linear relationship. Uh, that is to say, if it's a positive value, it takes on a positive value, um, it is a positive covariance. If it takes on a, a value of, Z, of a negative value, it is a negative linear relationship. It is also, um, because it's a set of cross products, these are measured in units of X and Y. Um, so we really can't compare or really assess what how strong a co uh, an association is based on a covariance by itself. That's it. A covariance of zero, though, what would that be? Well, it actually means there's no linear association. So it, and it, could, it could actually tell us that there is a linear association that is there, just doesn't tell us how strong it is. The correlation is the extension of the, the covariance standardized in terms of values of x and y. That is, if we standardize the covariance, we get what is called the correlation between two variables. We typically refer to these as variables x and y. We could use any algebraic uh, symbols to, to measure or, or assess that. And from pre the previous lecture, you should remember this equation uh, what is the uh, COVID, what is the correlation of R that we typically refer to as the with with the letter R and with the subscripts X and Y? If we want to indicate the, the correlation of X and Y, then it equals um, the um, sample um, covariance of X and Y. That's that's in the uh, numerator. It's in purple. And it's divided by the sample standard deviation of x multiplied by the sample standard deviation of y. So the sample standard deviation of x times the sample standard deviation of y is uh, is the is in the denominator, and the sample covariance of both of those are in the numerator in purple. Now. For the final exam, for in and in homework assignments and in, in the midterm, if we give you any one of those four values, if we give you what's in purple, if we take that equation, I'm gonna actually highlight this. Well, I, I just want to say just for practical purposes, if we give you this purple value, if we give you this blue value, this red value, or this black value as any number. Any, any three out of those um, one, two, three, four values, then you would be able to estimate what the outcome is. So if we give you the sa sample covariance of X and Y, the sample standard deviation of X and the sample standard de deviation of Y, then you should be able to calculate the correlation. Sim uh, similarly, if we give you the correlation and then the sample standard deviations of X and Y, you should know what the sample covariance of X and Y is. Now, here's a little twist here. Um, if we give you the uh, sample covariance of just X and the sample covariation of just Y, 
then you should also be able to that's derived the sample standard deviation of x and the sample standard deviation of y. That's because the, covert, the standard deviation is simply the, the um, square root of the covariance. But more broadly, aside from manipulating that equation, we also want you to know what, how to interpret a correlation and what a correlation coefficient, co, uh, coefficient is, typically indicated by R. It gives us the numerical summary of the strength and direction of a linear relationship between two variables. You should put an S there. Now, of course, when we talk about covariance and correlation, we're assuming that there is a linear relationship. Both of those um, measures um, are summary statistics that hypothesize that assume there's a linear association. In fact, as we talked about in earlier lectures, if there's if, if that linear assumption is violated, then uh, our, me our covariance and correlation measures are actually flawed. If there are, if there are outliers, if there's a nonlinear association, um, if there's anything else. So this is, we're going, always gonna assume a linear association for the purposes of the exam. We're not gonna trick you. But the, the insight and the input from the correlation uh, as, a, as a statistic is that as a descriptive statistic is that it's, um, it gives you a measure of strength. So a correlation in one study with different values, uh, units of X and Y can be compared across different studies with other values for X and Y. And a correlation that is uh, by definition as a result of the math is bound between negative one and positive one. And the sign indicates the strength of the relationship. So here we can talk about not just the, whether or not a really correlation, a linear relationship exists, that is whether or not it's non-zero, which is what we can do with the covariance, whether or not it was, it's in a positive uh, uh, association, or which is what we can do with the covariance, and whether or not it is a negative association as we can do with the co covariance, but also how strong it is, uh, a, a correlation of one, as a perfect linear positive relationship, conversely, a, a correlation of negative one is a uh, perfectly uh, linear negative relationship. That's as strong as you can get. A correlation that's closer to zero in absolute value, whether positive or negative, is a weaker linear association. So um, we might ask you questions about what, how strong a linear association is. And of course, this is all review, I know but it's important to emphasize when you talk about inferences. Now, linear regression, also called uh, simple regression, simple linear regression, or classical linear regression, or bivariate regression, or OLS, ordinary least squares regression, is another measure of association between two variables. Um, and this one, it's a way for fitting a line to a scatter plot of data. And here, um, the major insight between covariance and correlation is that while it is still shows strength and association, um, it gives us a means of interpreting and visualizing a linear association. And interpreting a linear association in terms of an X variable typically canonically um, rep indicated on the horizontal axis and the Y variable indicated on the uh, vertical axis. That's in contrast to the correlation or the covariance where there's no ordering in terms of the interpretation. Because when we talk about interpretation of a linear regression, we will interpret it in terms of how much does um, y change in units of y with every one unit increase in x? And more broadly, the interpretation is viewed as the quote unquote best line for the purposes of describing and predicting a quantitative variable with, of a given outcome. So when we think about a linear regression, the major insight here is about describing and predicting, predicting y given we have a value of x.
A correlation doesn't do that. It just gives us an association between two variables, neither is covariance. What linear regression does is it lets us understand what the expected value or, or expected mean of an outcome variable would be given our predictor variable x. And it's much better than eyeballing a line. <laughs> okay, these are, these, this is all review, but it's important to review in the sense that we really want to understand that these are all extensions and relate as developments based on, upon each other. Um, and we're really going to talk about correlation and linear regression in terms of inference because we can talk about a correlation um, in, as a way, in, as a statistic, as a measure of an association with some degree of certainty or 95% confidence interval. And the same goes with linear regression. Let me, let me, let me speed this up. I know I'm going a little too slow here. Um, and we're going to talk about inferences here. And I just want to take, give us a little brief review of where we were when we're reviewing key points about simple linear regression, and then we'll talk about how to conduct these inferential tests. Um, I, I emphasize part, uh, lecture 12, part one, on slides five and 29, because these focus on inferences for correlation, in which we use the correlation of a sample to make inferences about the population correlation. And recall that this population correlation coefficient, which we call rho, it's a Greek letter um, for the Greek letter for R. It looks like a little P, um, and that's because we typically talk about population parameters in terms of um, in terms of Greek symbols. So again, it, it only the correlation coefficient only measures the linear relationship between two numerical uh, variables. So let's go to inferences for regression. Um, so I'm going to review some basics. You should know this population and sample and the assumptions and conditions, and then what it means to, to, to infer a linear relationship. Um, and, this, and then we'll talk about some computational problems in the open intro statistics book and statistical reasoning questions. And we'll talk about naming that test if we have time. Okay. So when we talk about regression, we examine how to fit a linear regression based on a, on a data set. But when we compute a linear regression coefficients, that is the intercept and the slope, because that's all the coefficient is, the coefficients, uh, the coefficients that we use it is um, the intercept, which is the value of y, right, right, if we go right here, what is the value of y when x equals zero? That's the intercept. And then the slope, which is how deep or steep is that line going to be? Quite, it's, I hope it should be pretty intuitive what a slope is. Think about how, if you're walking up a hill, is it a negative or positive slope? Is it uphill or downhill? How steep is that slope? That's what the slope coefficient is. And when we compute linear regression coefficients, when we do this from a random sample of data, that is a simple random sample, and we want to infer that the intercept and the coefficient, how do we know that these coefficients aren't just due to random uh, sampling variability. Just like with correlation, we, make it, we can make inferences about the population coefficients using the coefficients from a random sample. So the point is, just as we talk about other kinds of statistics, t-tests, um, tests of proportions to make inferences, here we can do this with regression. In my view, this is the fundamental, this is the basis of modern statistics in, in practice. When we talk about what we do with regression, it isn't just to describe a sample, it's to describe a, a linear association uh, from a sample and infer that linear association to a population. Any questions? Um, I just want to show these, these little graphs here that you simply show. Here we have a distribution. Here we have uh, a plausible, pl different plausible values, simple random samples. And we don't know whether or not what our statistic is, is, is simply due to simple random sampling. We want to make sure that we can estimate what are the range of plausible lines or slopes 
what are the range of plausible intercepts uh, of our of of what we would hypothesize to exist in the population. We're not going to just have one slope. We're going actually going to have a hypothesized uh, slope in, uh, in, um, estimated with some degree of uncertainty. Here, we're going to go back to this, uh, you know, much debated statistic, this idea of p-values to determine whether the relationship between uh, these variables is statistically significant or not, whether or not um, the, the slope, for example, is statistically significant um, from, from chance. And when we, so it's, in essence, it's, it's, uh, it's an inferential test. And we talk about, when we talk about um, both coefficients, the intercept and the slope, the p-value uh, will tell us, and uh, the standard error uh, will both tell us um, whether or not the slope and the intercept are statistically significant from zero. And of course, we have to talk about uh, an idealized population. So we're going to sort of begin with a little bit of theory. We hope that this statistical theory will open your mind rather than close it. Um, so let's talk about the population in the sample with regression analysis that we've been doing so far. You remember that week when we looked at um, countries, we looked at the line of best fit for a given sample of data, right? We basically tried to minimize the sum of, of square, uh, sorry, we tried to minimize the, the, uh, the sum of, of uh, squared residuals. So in the graphs below, we see a scatter plot of body fat percentage uh, on the y-axis and waist size in inches um, in the uh, x-axis. And this is for a sample of about 250 men with different waist sizes. So there's a distribution of body fat percentage at different waist sizes. If we thought about this as a simple linear regression, or if we thought about this as a covariance, um, in terms of covariance, we could, we could say that it is a non-zero covariance uh, measured as the cross products uh, of waist size measured in inches and body fat as a percentage, either as a decimal place or perhaps a, a number from zero to one, and uh, with, with a positive value. And as a correlation, of a value that is definitely between zero and one, probably closer to point, above 0. 0.5. And as a simple linear regression, as, a, as an equation measured in terms of uh, the slope coefficient, which is how, how steep that line would be, the best linear fit, as well as its value at zero, which would be the intercept. But let's talk about population and sample, because we know that if we have 250 men, this is not the entire population. So we do know some, know some things when we talk about population of means, right? Or, or in, inferences of, uh, from, from numerical data. We know that for each waist size, there will be a distribution of body fat in this sample. The distribution of fat for men with a 38-inch 38, 38 waist is as follows. Okay. And of course, there is a distribution of body fat percentage for different waist sizes along the regression line for, for the sample that looks like this. So that is to say, at each value of x, we can think about what the value of, of, of um, y would be. Remember what the units are. Um, remember the, the, the y-axis is a distribution of body fat percentage. So for each x here, there is a scatter plot or, di or distribution for each one of these. Even if, in fact, it's because it's a continuous line, we could hypothesize with theory. There is a distribution at every value, technically. But in terms of actual empirical distributions, you could draw a, a distribution for each uh, value. So at 38 inches, you'll see a distribution like that. And you can see that for each one of these little hashtags, which I, uh, or these one, tick marks that we have, which is, I'm not sure what that is, how, how I scaled that but they have different distributions along each value of x. Okay, well, that's interesting, isn't it, right? We don't actually have a, um, 
have one uh, singular point. We knew this when we talked about the best linear fit. It is a model. We actually have a, distri a distribution, a what we call a conditional distribution with an expected value at the center of that distribution. In other words, when we talk about our, for every value of x, for every in waist inch value, there is an expected percentage body fat along the regression line that is actually represented as a, uh, both in terms of uh, what, what, it would, what the point estimate would be or what the measure of central tendency would be for each value of x, what would the value of y be, but also in terms of a, uh, a measure of spread of distribution for the, for the potential plausible values of y. It's, hopefully, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense when we talk about inferences. So when we talk about the population in the sample, if we wanted to, because we don't have points, we don't have as much data to show what would happen if we had a 38.5 um, waist size, what would the hypothesized distribution of, 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 of body fat percentage be, would be. We actually have to hypothesize that. It's not all empirical. We, don't, we can't do a histogram. So if we wanted to model the relationship between body fat percentage as on Y and waist size for all men in the population, we'd have to imagine a model of an idealized regression that looks like this. In fact, it looks a little bit more like this in terms of uh, its complexity. Because remember, X is a continuous line. No matter where you are on, on X, there is going to be a hypothesized linear fit and a hypothetical distribution. So even if we don't have data there, we would have a hypothesized distribution. That, that is, we would have an estimated value of Y as well as, an, as well as a hypothesized or an estimated spread of what that value for Y would be. That's why we, if you notice, notice what we have here, we have a set of what would be called conditional normal distributions because they're conditional, because um, each value of the normal distribution, that it's, 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 it, the, it's where its center uh, of, of alignment is, depends on our values of Y. So the way to talk about it is we have a distribution of Y values for each X value, whether real or hypothesized. So here we have some, we have a model that is informed by data, but we have a, a model that goes, uh, that is also informed by theory. So that way we can make estimates based on hypothetical values of X that don't exactly exist because we only have 250 men. And then we have hypo that will give us conditional or, exp or predicted values of Y with a measure of uncertainty based on our, on our, on our conditional distributions of y. Now, as I said before, these distributions go back to our normal distribution model. So in that way, it's um, in, in the sense that we are estimating what a mean is, what a conditional mean is of y, we're using the same logic as we would with, say, um, statistical inference when we talk about um, 95% confidence intervals, or t-tests, or even differences in proportions, because those actually rely on um, inferences based on distributions with spreads in central tendency. So the insight that we're, we're, we're having when we talk about inferences and regression is that we're not just predicting a simple value of y given x. We're predicting um, what the y would be, as well as it's uncertain, it, as well as it's hypothetical, plausible range of values. So these distributions follow a normal model with means lined up along the same regression line and with the same standard deviation. And of course, because these are uh, um, population uh, means and population standard deviations conditional on values of x, we would, we would use mu uh, as, as, uh, and, and we use uh, Greek symbols, um, whatever, sigma for uh, conditional standard deviations. Uh, and in fact, we will also use Greek symbols when we talk about the um, 
when we write out the idealized regression model. When I say idealized, I mean the hyper, the, the hypothesized uh, estimated population regression line, the one that we do not observe in the population. Um, instead of using um, y and, and x not plus x, x1 or whatever, uh, or sorry, b, b of one, b of b not plus b1 of x, we're going to use mu of y. What is the expected mean of y in the population? S, which is, of course, going to be have some degree of uncertainty. Um, measured in terms of beta naught, which is the intercept, plus beta 1 of x, or, or b1 of x. Uh, beta 1 of x, we use these little subscripts because these indicate the number of coefficients. Beyond this course, and when you take more statistics, we all often talk about adding what we call the kitchen sink of other regression coefficients. Because if we want to estimate beta 1 of x, we want to partial out or we want to take away any potential confounders or other kinds of variables that might account for that association. But for now, just keep in mind that these zeros and ones, these will index. In, in cardinal order, our coefficients. The x is simply um, the value of x, what our x variable is. y is our y variable. But mu is our hypothesized value of y in the population. And these beta coefficients are hypothesized or estimate. We should, we should really say estimated population parameters. It's not what we observe, it's what we estimate. And we estimate those with some uncertainty, which is why uh, we will estimate those with a, with a hypothesized value and then determine what using p-values, whether or not those are statistically different from zero. Okay. Let's continue. Hold on, sorry. Okay, now this is where it gets interesting. And this is where, when we talk about inferences, this is why regression is different than correlation and why the order of X and Y matter. When we talk about predicting Y given a value of X in the population, Y is not just a simple direct, um, relationship between x and y. y is measured with some uncertainty because we're not exactly sure what y would be if we know what x is. We can hypothesize what x can be. That's our predictor variable. But then when we hypothesize y in the actual population, we know that it is some hypothesized estimated uh, intercepts with some degree of uh, um, precision given our normal distribution model. We have the coefficient for x, which is our slope of the line. But then we have that uncertainty. And in fact, um, that's often called the error term. It doesn't mean error in terms of mistakes. It means that, um, that our hypothesized regression model does not take into account that in our actual population, not all individual y's are at these means. Not one regression line will describe all y values. Right? It's, it's, that's just the truth. Our population will, by definition, have many different y's, not just one y. So to estimate y, as opposed to remember mu of y, right? If, if we if estimate one y, it makes sense, but when we sorry mu of y, we don't need to have an error term because that's the mean of y given our slope and our intercept of uh, given our value of x multiplied by our slope and our intercept. So if we have you know this right here as our x, we can estimate what mu of y would be and and the distribution of potential mu and y. But when we talk about, hold on, sorry, what the actual y would be, 
for a particular value of x, we're going to use this error term. And this is because not all individual y's are at these means, with, because some are below and some are uh, above the line with errors. We'd miss most of the values. So we assume the error terms are, are, are randomly distributed around the regression line, because we assume that not exactly correctly here, but we'd assume that we, we account for all the variation that might hypothesize our association between X and Y. So as long as we make that assumption, um, we're okay with, with that. In fact, that's just an assumption that we have in the model. Um, so when you're a practicing statistician, we often include what I said we call the kitchen sink because we want to include so many other confound, potential confounders if we want to estimate X and Y that we really want to make sure that any, anything left over is just is indeed random noise. Um, but keep in mind that um, when we talk about our degree of imprecision, given our values of X and uh, uh, or given our values of X within the population sample, and we want to estimate to the population, we're going to estimate X, Y, our, our expected value of Y is going to be um, our hypothesized coefficient, sorry, our estimated co uh, intercept, our estimated slope, plus our hypothesized, or an error term uh, indicated by epsilon, which is to account for our um, deviations from our idealized uh, value. So when to estimate the, the betas or the slope and the y-intercepts, we can use the same regression line that we, we first printed in part A. So instead of the for, this formula, y equals beta x plus beta of one, sorry, beta naught plus beta one of x plus e, we're gonna use y hat. Uh, B of not plus B one of X. Um, we use the Y hat to emphasize that it is estimated. Um, and that we don't get the true value. And we use least squares regression as, we, as we've done before to give us reasonable estimates of the parameters of the population from a random sample of the data. So keep in mind, we don't ever really know what epsilon is. We don't ever know what the value of epsilon is. We know it exists when we estimate to the population. And we actually um, hope that the covariance between um, um, y or the covariance of uh, x, well, we should hope that this should be accounted for. This is completely random. That's what I really want to say. But uh, often it isn't in, in practice, which, which would bias our, our estimates. But we don't need to worry about that. But just keep in mind, we don't really know what epsilon is. We just know it exists. So then that's where we go here. Where did epsilon go? Um, if we talk about y hat, well, because we're estimating, right? It's called y hat. That's how, how I call it. Um, probably because it has a little, a little hat there. Um, we talk about the relationship between the two variables in the population with a random sample, and we don't need to account for the errors in the model, but we also don't know what they are. So we can proceed to make any inferences about the population by conducting hypotheses, tests, and or constructing confidence intervals. And we have to make some assumptions about the models and the errors. So the models and the errors are going to be made, are going to be assumed to be accounted for in terms of 95% um, confidence intervals and, and hypothesis tests. We just, we, and we're always going to make sure that we have a Y hat, sometimes a Y bar, but just keep in mind um, our true pop, our mu of Y, so our actual Y in the population measured with, with the, all that noise, the error term. Uh, we just hope we, we never, we're never certain that our error term is actually um, accounted for, but we hope that our error term is in the statistical sense, random noise and not something that is systematically biasing um, our values. We, we wanna, we're gonna make the heroic assumption that epsilon is just noise because we ex we've explained everything. Even in a simple linear regression, we're gonna assume that no, no confounders. So, and we'll talk about those assumptions a little bit 
later, but just keep in mind the assumptions we have is that we do have a linear association that exists. Um, and we can check that, of course. These are called, there's a whole science of regression diagnostics. It's not done enough. In fact, if you ever want to, and in more advanced classes, I hope to teach you in more advanced classes to talk more about regression diagnostics. It's the, this is when it's good to peek at your data because you want to make sure that your model actually doesn't have any violated assumptions. And this is the same kind of problem or issue that we face when we talk about correlations or covariances. Those, those, are, tend to, those assume that we have measured a linear relationship. Well, we can check it out. We can eyeball it. Does the scatter plot appear linear? We can check the residuals to see if they're randomly uh, scattered around the data. Um, but another assumption is that, is that are the data quantitative or numerical? Um, no, I just read yesterday, technically, you can use a binary variable as an outcome and actually assume that uh, it's okay to use a linear regression, but in most practice, you can't get away with that. There are other kinds of what, what are called link functions between um, what's on the right side of the equation, you know, the error terms and the intercepts and the coefficients, and then our outcome y. The link function tells us how those are connected. We use an equal sign when we talk about a linear association. Well, we can do a transformation that that kind of transmogrifies that association so that way we can measure, that we can estimate uh, the y outcome if it's binary or, or if it has ordinal categories, let's say if it's a categorical variable. Those are called logistic regression and ordinal logistic regression. And there's multinomial regression, which talks about, which is a way of estimating unordered categories. There's a Poisson regression, which estimates counts. Those are all variants of the linear model. This is why we're really going to talk about the linear model. Um, so, but general, generally, you want to make sure the, the outcome is a quantitative variable. So, the, for the predictive variables, you can you don't have to worry about that. We talk about another major assumption. This is the independence of errors assumption. Um, um, what do I mean by that? Well, this simply means that if you um, um, are the individuals of a random sample, if uh, are the uh, are the units of analysis, in other words, are they un are they each? Does knowing the value of one individual tell us something about the value of another? Right. So if we had a non-random sample. Uh, then we cannot associate, we cannot measure a linear relationship. In fact, we can't do most of the statistical tests that we've employed so far. It's, it's something that we focus on more when we talk about the independent of errors assumption or the independence of assumption. We talk about independence of errors because that's where we see the problem when we talk about um, correlated observations. Correlated observations are cases where, let's say we uh, um, sample 20 kids in one school, and then we sample a uh, thousand kids in another, or say 40 kids in another school. And those kids have a lot in common with each other. And we treat all of those kids as if they're totally unrelated to one another. Well, if we do that and we, and we assume that those students are essentially from a, sam a random sample, even if those students were randomly sampled within those schools, there's still two different sa um, random samples, and they cannot be aggregated. Um, now, of course, there is a way to account for that. We can put in a variable that, that, that soaks up that variation, um, or you can aggregate to the school level. So you have just two, two classrooms. That doesn't make too much sense, but if you had 400 classrooms, you can aggregate. Or you can use other kinds of assumptions that actually account for correlated um, observations. Um, and this is apparent when we talk about errors, because remember errors are here are just random noise around y that are represented uh, on the right hand side of the equation. It's not, an, there, there's, you don't have random noise around your regression line if you're not accounting for some confounders or the observations are not independent. Because, because then, then your regression line, what does it really tell you? It's not informative if, if, if the observations are not independent. 
And yeah, you can check the residuals if you don't know, but you can also just look at theory and see how the data were collected. Um, the equal variance assumption. Um, this is also called uh, the assumption, and here's the word of the day, homoscedasticity. I've spoken with colleagues and they were surprised that I knew this word. I thought, I thought people practicing in the field for 20 years would know this, but you can really impress people to ask them about the homoscedasticity assumption. It actually means that for every value of x, you can just see a, a, just a, a swarm of, a, a, an equal swarm of, of errors, of residuals. The residuals should not have any patterns here. Um, if the residuals are, are patterned in any way, then maybe you don't have a linear assumption. Um, maybe something else is going on, but the point is you cannot, the, 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 the assumption in your, in your statistical model is violated. Um, I have a little asterisk here because um, we talk about the root mean squared error. The assumption here is that the same values it's the same for all values of the input variable in the population. And this is why we have to assume this to be true. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these are assumptions. <laughs> in practice, I don't know. I think most regressions are probably violating at some degree the, these, some of these assumptions. We try our best not to. Right? We'll include x values. We'll do regression diagnostics. We'll do linear transformations of variables. We will use a different link function. We'll, um, we'll do plenty of other things, but this is, if you go to an academic talk or an academic debate or a job talk, this is, or even present research, this is, these are the questions that go through every statistician's mind. When I read a paper, when I, even, even the big name papers, I often always want to see the data. I want to see, eh, what are their assumptions? Did they really do something right here? Or if you model the data, did it differently? Is there something else that we can find? Is this an artifact of just a few outliers? This is, this is, this is a big ongoing debate. This is not going to end. Let's go to the, the other assumption. Um, because we're using, um, a, a, assuming normality of the residuals, we have the normal population assumption. We assume that these normals, these errors follow a normal model or a normal distribution at each value of x um, or a nearly normal condition. Um, just basically look at the history, you can look at a histogram of the residuals. Um, but keep in mind again, this is an assumption that we make. Now that being said, uh, there are other techniques you can use to, to relax some of these assumptions about normality of the residuals. Um, you can estimate the standard errors differently, which is beyond the scope of the course. Uh, this is, for, to me, this is not as big of a worry. But it's still something that we have. Uh, it's a crucial assumption, but it's something that can be somewhat relaxed. Keep in mind when we talk about the t-distribution, when the t-distribution at a certain value becomes uh, of n, it turns in, into the normal distribution. The normal distribution is not is not so central, but it is. It's it's important. It's central to our interpretation, but violations of the normal distribution are not as problematic, actually. Um, oops. Looks like I, I'm not sure why that's there. Oh, well, I, oops, I'll fix that later. Um, when we talk about regression uh, inference, um, we have a couple hypothesis tests, but the main one we want to focus on is the hypothesis test for the slope. Remember when we talked about regression uh, uh, inferences, hold on for a second. I got to get rid of this. Um, okay, that looks better. Let me go. Um, okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, when we talk about regression inference, we have an inference of the, uh, the test of the slope. All of these are going to be uh, similar in logic in terms of, um, how do I put it? Uh, in terms of how, uh, how we estimate 
um, statistical significance using a p-value uh, and a measure of, of, of discrepancy of our estimate with our, our hypothesized null value or null, or null hypothesis. And when we talk about regression, our null hypothesis is going to be zero. That our coefficient is going to equal zero. So when we talk about the inference for the slope, our null hypothesis is, is going to be that our, our slope is equal to zero, that is, it is flat. And our alternative hypothesis is, is that our slope is non-zero. That is, it's a two-sided test that we hypothesize that the slope is either positive or negative. And notice we start with the slope and not with the intercept because the intercept, as we recall before, isn't as informative. I, I often, when I look at regression output, I actually don't often look at the intercept because quite often it's statistically significant. Uh, and quite often, a statistically significant intercept without a statistically significant slope is not very informative. Now, vice versa, a statistically significant intercept, so our slope without, a, without an intercept doesn't seem to happen as often in practice. I think I've seen it once, but it was in a problem set where, where the student was trying to be uh, tricked or we were trying to, the teacher was trying to teach something. This is when I was doing some tutoring. But just keep in mind, we're more often interested in the slope. And the, when we talk about the slope, um, the, the test statistic for the intercept is uh, our estimated slope times the standard, oh, sorry, over the standard error of, of that slope. And um, the standard error of the slope um, is just the uh, standard deviation divided by some, basically, uh, how do you put it? The square root of uh, uh, residuals, you could say. Now I'm putting this here with a little asterisk because you almost never have to estimate by hand and certainly not for STAT E100, um, what this is um, in terms of what, what, the, uh, what the slope is. But just keep in mind the standard error is our measure of dispersion, our hypothesized measure of dispersion, just as we would with a normal distribution. Um, so I think that's all I need to say here. Um, when we talk about the confidence interval for the slope, it's just an extension of the standard error. So a confidence interval, our 95% confidence interval, is one plus or minus, um, uh, sorry, sorry, it's, pl it's a plus or minus uh, uh, the, the standard error. By the way, for the, for, for the final exam, you don't have to memorize these equations. What you're gonna have to do is interpret the, the estimates here. So uh, just keep in mind the standard error is your hypothesized, uh, it's, it's your hypothesized deviation, standard deviation of the intercept. Um, the 95% confidence interval is um, typically um, plus or minus um, um, two times the standard error. So when we talk about um, the slope of, the, of a regression line, um, we're going to talk about in terms of hypothesis testing. But before we do that, I just want to emphasize that our, the logic of inference is essentially the same as we've done before. We have a point estimate. That is, we have a, an estimate that we believe to be the most likely value. Then we have a range of plausible values estimated by a confidence interval which in, in itself is derived from uh, a measure of hypothesized average variation from our point estimate. In this case, we talk about standard error. On average, how much would our point estimate of our slope vary? And if our point estimates are very large, and our, I'm oh, sorry, if our point estimate is uh, close to zero, and our, our slope and our, standard errors are very large or some combination thereof, 
then it's likely that our, that our uh, null value, uh, we fail to reject the null value that our slope is zero. So the main point is that inference, uh, inference in, in regression is, is really determining or evaluating whether our slope is different from zero. And that slope, the difference of our, of our slope from being from zero is whether or not our 95% confidence interval includes zero. And our 95% confidence interval for the slope is a function of how large our, S, our, our standard error is and the size, the, the absolute size of our point estimate. So you can have a very small point estimate, a very small slope that's that with very much, much smaller standard errors. And as long as, our, as, long as those standard errors um, and our very small um, point estimate exclude zero in our 95% confidence interval, then we can say that we have a non-zero slope, even though that's a very small slope. Concomitantly, we can have a very large point estimate and an even larger standard error, a very much larger confidence interval. And that would tell us that, in fact, with such a large confidence interval, um, our range of plausible values equals zero, and we fail to reject the null. So let me talk about that when you're looking at this slide here. We're going to talk about our null and alternative hypotheses, and we're going to talk about inference when we talk about the slope. So this is what you're going to do. First thing you want to do when you talk about inference, you want to state the target population and the parameters of interest. That is the slope and the intercept. That is, you really want to know what you're inferring to. If you think about the Titanic data set, it, it's debatable about whether or not there's a hyper, uh, hyper parameters that, are, that exist in some sort of population that are, you can't estimate. Because as far as I can know, there's only one Titanic um, data set. There's only one group of passengers. We can describe what happened to those passengers. Um, but it, it's unclear whether or not there's a population to be estimated from that. I say unclear because in practice, I will actually see non-random samples that are descriptive and historical that actually include an, an, uh, inferential statistics. Because maybe you, you could talk about some hyper population of 19th century shipping vessels or, or, or luxury vessels. I'm not sure. It's beyond the scope of this class, but just keep in mind you want to think about this. Beyond that, First, very philosophical approach, you have your standard tests of deductive hypothesis testing. You want to state the null and alternative hypotheses, which is H0 or HA. So H0 would be whether it is assumed that the slope is zero. There's no linear association between uh, X and Y and all, the alternative hypothesis, which in practice is always two-sided, non-zero. But in, in theory, you may want to actually estimate or hypothesize a positive or negative slope. But in practice, it's a two-sided test. It's whether or not, so the null hypothesis is a non, uh, is a, uh, we start with the assumption that there is no linear relationship. And then if you reject that null hypothesis, then you'd say that the slope is non-zero. Uh, keep in mind that only tests statistical significance. You also want to step two is to select the significance value alpha. That is your criterion for assessing, uh, uh, for rejecting the null. We almost use that at, as alpha of 0.05. Uh, recently, we've been talking about smaller uh, alphas because it's increasingly easy with computational software and algorithms to come up with, with ridiculous statistical significance. Um, then you want to um, compute the the test uh, the t test statistic. That's why I didn't emphasize before. But when you talk about the standard errors, it's actually estimated from the uh, t test uh, statistic, which is which estimates the distribution of our point estimate. And then from there, we assume that the null is true, and we make the decision by comparing the test statistic t 
with a critical value, which is typically 0 0.05 or 5%. And by comparing um, the p-value with the significance alpha. So the point is that whenever you see the output, you're going to have a p-value for every slope and a regression line with, with statistical inference to a population, you're going to have a, a, a standard error estimated with a t-test or a statistic. And then you're going to have a p-value. Now, the test statistic and the critical values and the, give us a p-value. Um, but that doesn't necessarily tell us uh, substantive significance. So you can talk about it. You can reject the null hypothesis at 0 0.05 or at the 5% level. But you have to interpret the regression line as we've done in earlier weeks if you want to talk about substantive significance. And that's what you want to do when you state your conclusion, not just whether or not this, the slope is statistically significant. I would add to step five, talk about we, fit, we reject the null hypothesis. Or if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, you can still say something about what the association is. Because if you fail to reject the null hypothesis, it could be because even though you observe a gigantic slope, you very, see a very steep line, it's poorly estimated, it's imprecise. There's a lot of noise. So you can have a really wide confidence interval, but you might have a steep slope. That's still something in, informative in the data or in the hypothesis, in the idealized data set, and then also in terms of what you observe. Um, I agree with some people, I think, but not with everyone that we should talk about not just standard errors, but about confidence intervals. So for me, whenever I publish papers with regression, I almost always try to provide what the slope is, and then I provide the confidence interval for the slope. That's, to me, that's much more informative than the, what is often included, which is the, the, uh, the, the slope and then maybe the standard error. And then when you talk about significance in the text, they'll say the t-test, and they'll give the p-value. I don't want any of that. I want to know what the range of plausible values are. That's, that's me, and I think that's more informative. Um, and I always say it's always useful to estimate a confidence interval because it talks about your range of plausible values. Because you can have a highly statistically significant uh, coefficient, a slope, um, that's really imprecise. Right? Statistical significance does not tell us about precision. You can also have, uh, an, you can also fail to reject the null, and you can also have a very precise estimate of, of the slope. And that's much more informative. Imagine if you had a null, if you fail to reject the null hypothesis of, uh, say, of, and you, you conclude um, that the, the, the slope is non zero because you reject the null. If you have a very narrow 95% confidence interval, your range of plausible values are going to be very close to zero. And we use statistical software to find the uh, uh, 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval for the, for the correlation in the population. When I say correlation here, I, I would say more say coefficient. We often talk, but sometimes we can use correlation interchangeably with, with coefficient. But when we talk about regression, I actually would encourage you to use the word co coefficient. Keep in mind, a correlation is a coefficient. But I encourage you to talk about coefficients when you talk about regression, because it's actually a partial correlation. You partial out the correlation um, when you talk about the slope, because you partial out um, the intercept. And when you have multiple regression, you would partial out all of the other potential conf confounders. I don't, I'm, that's a little bit beyond the course, but just keep in mind that a, a coefficient in multiple regression, in most papers that you will see, the, the slope itself is in a 
not just in a, in a two-dimensional uh, plane, it's in a hyperplane. Uh, you have 10 parameters, it's, it's in 10, it's, it's in a k-dimensional hyperplane. It's pretty wild to think about, but that's, the way, that's what we do. You minimize the, the, the hyperdimensional residuals. Um, we talk about the stand of the interval um, is given by uh, essentially by uh, the t test um, plus or minus um, the, the I guess the, the standard error and the interval is interpreted as the same other, as same as other confidence intervals as we've encountered. Um, So do, we can talk about some problems. Computational problems from open intro, oh, statistical reasoning questions. And also talk about name that test. Let me see if we have enough time. Um, we don't actually have enough time to go through these too quickly. Um, I'm going to go through these, if you don't mind, pretty quickly. Let's talk about some of these questions, computational problems from open intro. Beer and alcohol and blood content. Um, this is uh, in honor of uh, William Seeley Gossett. Many people believe that gender, weights, drinking habits, and many other factors are much more important in predicting blood alcohol content than simply considering the number of drinks a person can con consumed. Here we examine data from 16 students at Ohio State University who each drank a randomly assigned number of cans of beer. These students were evenly divided between men and women and they differed in weighting drinking habits. 30 minutes later, a police officer measured their blood alcohol content in grams of alcohol per de uh, deciliter blood. The scatter plot and regression table summarizes the findings. There you are. This is on page 368 of the Open Intro Stats book. So look what we have here. This is what your output's gonna be. You're gonna have an estimate, a point estimate. This is your uh, intercept. And then you're gonna have, right below it, you're gonna have the coefficient. This is the slope. So keep in mind, you have an intercept that's negative, which is the value of y given zero. You have the intercept, which is our, our best guess at what the slope is, our best linear fit. Then you have the standard error, which is our measure of uncertainty. Uh, and we, here we have a slightly larger measure of uncertainty. Now we have two values here, which, is, which assess statistical significance. Quite often when you look at published data sets, you won't even look at the T value. You might see it reported in the text. Keep in mind um, that the T, the T value itself um, also depends on your degrees of freedom, which is the number of parameters in your model. But keep in mind, look at this. Here you have a intercept that is not statistically significant, but you have a slope where the P value is definitely less than 0 0.05. Um, in fact, you have a negative t-value here, but the point is, yeah, the t-value and in, in, in is not often as often discussed about, except maybe if you're in psychology. I see that more. I don't know why. It's just, it just seems, seems to be standard practice. Now, what I don't like about this, of course, is look what you get from these numbers. You don't really get a good sense of um, the 95% confidence interval. The other point when you look at in inferential uh, practice and regression is Unlike correlation, this, these values are not standardized. By themselves, these coefficients mean nothing to me. They should mean nothing to you. I don't know what point blah, 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 blah is. In fact, even the precision isn't that informative without understanding the standard error. So you need to know the units when you talk about interpreting regression. You need to know the standard error if you want to make any kind of inference about whether or not the 95% confidence interval includes zero. And quite often, you will have the T statistic or the, or the p-value to make inferences. OK, so it looks like beers are, are linearly associated with um, beer uh, with blood alcohol content, but the intercept is, is zero. Um, and that's why I said here that you can describe the relationship. It seems to be a positive linear relationship. You can write out the regression line. Um, this is just something to think about um, and interpret in context. As I said before, here units matter. So you're going to talk about 
a one unit increase in beers increase um, blood alcohol content um, for, let's see, by, um, what is it, point zero, basically 0 0.018 grams of alcohol per deciliter of blood. Um, and when you write out the regression line, keep in mind you're not going to include epsilon here. You don't know what that is. Um, you just include y hat as your outcome. y hat equals negative da 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 plus this value of the slope times x. Um, do the data provide strong evidence that drinking more cans of beer is associated with increase of blood alcohol? You state the null and alternative hypothesis. Keep in mind when we talk about this, we're going to talk about it in terms of the slope, not necessarily in terms of the intercept. Um, we talk about the correlation coefficients. The number of cans is, is 0.89. Uh, calculate r squared and interpret it in context. Um, now that's not exactly here that we talked about, but it is important to emphasize um, what the R squared is um, in terms of what it is in context. And here we can say that the R squared is the proportion, the, you know, the portion of variance explained in Y um, by variation in X. Now in practice, R squared can be very little, very small. Um, but here, here it seems to be uh, quite large. Um, I don't think we have other uh, examples except um, yeah, we can talk about one, one outlier if you wanted to add, add more to that. This is what the equation would look like. Often we write the equation of y in terms of the what the actual value is. Um, now, let's, I didn't mention the intercept, but students who don't have any beer are expected to have a blood alcohol content that doesn't make any sense. Um, and that's not statistically significant from zero. So there's not much to make from it. it it's not really conclusive, but it just, it just goes to show you quite often either the intercept doesn't make any sense or is not the central part of the story you're often more interested in the slope. Um, it's still important if you want to predict and estimate certain values. Let's see, you wanted to say, well, what, how much, what's the, what's the BAC of a student we hypothesize to be if that student had 10 beers? Okay, well, we will be able to do that. And what is about the size value if they had one beer? We can still do that. You'll need the intercept to do that as we've done with descriptive statistics. Um, Again, this is, this is, you know, from the book. Um, now, we talk about the null and alternative hypotheses. Um, we'd say the, the p-value is two-sided, and um, it's approximately zero. It's a very small p-value for the slope. And so we, we know that if a two-sided test of the hypothesis is small, so is a one-sided hypothesis. And with such a small p-value, we reject the null and conclude that the data provide convincing evidence that a number of cans of beer consumed and blood alcohol content are positively associated with each other and the true slope parameter is greater than zero. Um, R squared. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I, oh, I say, it says to estimate or calculate R squared. Um, so if R is 0 0.89, um, R squared is 0.79, um, we basically, in essence, do that by, um, if I can show you. Um, Um, just keep in mind that the, the, the correlation coefficient um, is different than the, than the R squared here. And the main interpretation is that variability in blood alcohol content um, is, is explained by about 79% um, of the outcome. Um, 
So in terms of, um, let me think. Um, do you know how we get from 0.89 to 0.79 in terms of R squared? I'm sorry. Well, in any case, um, quite often that's put in the output, but um, we have a couple other examples that um, come from the uh, the open intro book. So I, I won't go into that too much, except to say, sometimes we talk about R squared and we also talk about adjusted R squared, um, but the same kinds of questions exist. And I would definitely recommend you go through those. Uh, in fact, I'll show you where those are. We'll go to page 388. Um, I don't want us to get into logistic regression. Let's open intro. Hold on. I'm just taking a, uh, actually, I might have had the wrong page listed. Um, Well, I can show that later. But anyway, the main point is um, a lot of the, the work that we do when we talk about the T value, the P value, standard error, and point estimate, we typically use statistical software to find point estimates and standard errors. And as long as the main point is we want to emphasize the, the assumptions. Um, and the other main conclusion I want to make is that we don't just carelessly use the p-value from regression outputs. Don't just say, okay, we're statistically significant. That's it. That's the end of the story. That's all she wrote. Um, that's when you get into trouble. Um, I don't want us to go over too much um, in, in terms of the outcome, but I just, um, I think those are the, the main points that I want to make when, when we talk about um, uh, regression um, interpretation. Um, in terms of statistical reasoning, that you know, I, I, we won't have time to go through that, but just keep in mind those are from, from the book. Um, I think the last thing I want to talk about in just in the last few minutes is, um, this is from the fourth edition, is just when we talk about the statistical tests that you use, and we're going to talk about this in review as well, and it's a big question for a lot of the final projects. Which test do you use with so many? Um, so for the first question, I would, I would ask, well, let's say we ask, what, how does the cost of a movie depend on its length? Right? We have cost and we have length. And I give you a bunch of examples. We talk about the one sample Z test or Z interval for proportions, one sample T test for means, uh, for, and then a, two sample tests for proportions, two sample t-tests or t-interval for means, goodness chi-square fit test, this chi-square test of independence, and then the correlation uh, t-test and or t-interval, and then the slope t-test or t-interval for regression lines. Which one are we gonna do? Well, the main one we wanna do is maybe the, the slope t-test uh, or, or t-interval. Right, because they're both with two quantitative variables, right? The cost in terms of uh, money, length in terms of money. Now, of course, this is all depends on the structure of the variables. Let's say we had uh, two, uh, one of those variables were dichotomous. Let's say we had uh, cost as a continuous numerical variable, and then length was, say, short films and long feature films, the two categories. Well, in that case, it would probably make sense um, to do a t-test of, um, let's see, a two-sample t-test or t-interval for means right here, right? Because then you're testing the mean difference between two groups with a null hypothesis that those two means are zero. Um, 
Uh, the, the second test, um, if you have a bunch of categories, you might do a chi-squared uh, uh, goodness of fit test. You have a mixture of nuts. Um, you, you can go through the details. And you wonder whether your mix is significantly different from what the company ad advertises. So you have a hypothesized distribution. And you want to do a um, see whether that hypothesized distribution of proportions is different from the actual observed distribution. Remember that the chi-square goodness of fit test is different than the, the chi-square test of independence, which is about whether or not two categorical variables are independent of each other, with the null hypothesis being the assumption that the distribution uh, of, of proportions is, is, is zero, or is equal in all categories. Um, I will finish on this one. Um, the, the last example I'll give is you'd like to know whether or not people are likely to differ likely to offer a different amount for a used camera when buying from a friend than when buying from a stranger, or if there's no difference at all. What's the answer here? Well, a two-sample t-test or t-interval for means, because the cue here is that we have a different amount, and we have different categories, when they're buying from a friend or when buying for a stranger. Stranger. And the null hypothesis is that there'd be no difference. Um, we're close to finishing it up, but I think we covered the main categories. We reviewed what, um, how to infer. Uh, I, I try. We reviewed some of the concepts behind um, covariance, correlation, and regression. We talked about um, the assumptions behind uh, linear regression. And then we talked about. Um, uses for inferring regression. And then we looked at an example from the Open Intro Stats book. And finally, we talked about naming that test. And uh, we, here we have a list of, of examples here. Um, that's it for now. And I will see you this upcoming Tuesday after the um, exam comes um, at 5 o'clock. I'm going to make a course announcement. I'll make a change that we're going to have section the day after our final paper uh, is due. That way you have time. In the interim, feel free to contact me. Um, otherwise, have a great weekend and uh, feel free to address and ask any and all sorts of questions. Um, and we will spend the rest of the time intensively reviewing these, not just this concept, but all others, I would hope, in an integrated way. This is what I'm sort of getting at when I have you sort of think about naming that test. We're actually going to integrate and combine everything. So. Thank you very much, and um, I shall see you uh, shortly in, in the interim. Um, don't be okay, a, thank you. And then could you also uh, just oh, let us know oh, what time oh, the oh, section oh, is on Tuesday? Oh, yeah, hold on for a second. Um, yeah, yeah.